Hi, I'm Professor David Atley, and this is Topics in Astronomy. Thank you for joining me. In today's mini-lecture, I'll be talking to you about the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect was one of the most important discoveries in physics in the last, say, 200 years. It launched the quantum revolution, which in turn is responsible for much of modern living. Without our understanding of quantum mechanics, it would be impossible to build a lot of the things that modern life relies on, including transistors and microchips. The photoelectric effect was discovered at the end of the 19th century by the man you see pictured on the top right-hand side of the slide. That's um, Heinrich Hertz, and he was attempting to confirm that light acts like an electromagnetic wave. And in doing that, he discovered a new phenomenon that was a byproduct of his experiments. And this is an example of one of those important serendipities that sometimes occur when you're doing science, where you're conducting an experiment to try to investigate a phenomenon, and you look at your results and you go, huh, that's funny. And sometimes the that's funny is responsible for launching an, an entirely new line of inquiry, and in this case, an entirely new branch of physics. What Hertz discovered was that when light hits the surface of a metal, the light stimulates the release of electrons from the metal. And that release is what we call the photoelectric effect. Essentially what happens is the energy carried by the light strikes the metal, it strips out electrons from the metal, and then if we set up a experimental apparatus carefully, we're going to be able to measure those electrons and quantify them. So how many electrons are coming out, how fast, that kind of thing. Knowing what we know about how light is supposed to work, according to 19th century physics, you could make a definite prediction for one type of behavior that you should see in experiments studying the photoelectric effect. And that is that as the light gets brighter, that is, its amplitude increases, then the increased energy in the light should liberate more electrons. That's just basic wave mechanics. So let's have a look at what was actually discovered when physicists began to investigate this photoelectric effect. What they found was much more complicated than you would predict naively just knowing the wave theory of light. For example, some types of light, like infrared light, never expel any electrons. No matter how bright you make the light, you're never going to start producing any photoelectrons from your metal. And in general, for all metals, there is a threshold wavelength in order to produce photoelectrons. So starting from long wavelength in the infrared, you go no electrons, no electrons, no electrons, and then suddenly you hit that threshold and boom, you have electrons coming out. So it's a complete step function. You have none, and then you have some. And there's no real transition in between those two states. If you continue to decrease the wavelength beyond the threshold wavelength, then you see that as you shine light on your metal, the electrons start to come out faster. So they come out with greater speed. And when you have passed that threshold wavelength, then you see the results of the photoelectric effect experiment conforming to your expectations. Let's have a look at how this experiment actually looks using this simulator produced by the PHET group at the University of Colorado Boulder. We'll start out looking at light that works in the infrared. So I've set the light at the beginning of this example to a wavelength of 800 nanometers, which is well into the infrared. And as I start cranking up the intensity with this slider, you'll see that nothing's happening. So you don't see anything, which is exactly what you should see, is that when we're working in the infrared, we don't get any electrons coming out of our metal, no matter how bright we make it. So let's just leave the intensity there and start sliding the wavelength down until we can see where the threshold wavelength is. So we'll start moving into the red, and then from the red towards progressively shorter and shorter wavelengths towards the blue and violet end of the spectrum. As we gradually decrease the wavelength, nothing's happening. 
but eventually we're going to get to a point where some electrons are going to start to come out. Okay, I've crossed now into the ultraviolet, and there. Now we have some electrons coming free. So for this metal, for copper, the threshold wavelength is actually well into the ultraviolet, unlike the case with some other metals like sodium, where the threshold wavelength is in the visible. You'll see that there are electrons at a bunch of different speeds, some of them very, very slow, others very, very fast. So I'm going to turn off the light just to clear out all of those electrons. Get out of there. Okay, so let's turn the light back up at this wavelength. So now we see electrons coming out with modest speed. Some of them are fast, others are a little bit slower. But as, as I go towards shorter wavelength, say 150 nanometers, you'll see that those electrons are going to come out faster than they were before. And as I keep going, we're going to end up with greater and greater speed. Now they're coming out much more quickly than they were before because the very short wavelength light is giving them a bunch of extra energy beyond what's necessary to kick them out of the metal. So how can we understand this weird behavior which doesn't comport with our predictions? The explanation was ultimately developed in 1905 by Albert Einstein, and that was one of his three famous papers um, in the so-called Annus Mirabilis, or the Year of Miracles. Um, Einstein decided that you could explain the photoelectric effect if you assume that light sometimes acts like a particle. A particle of light, called a photon, was first proposed several years before by the physicist Max Planck in his discussion of how to explain blackbody radiation. But Planck had assumed that the photon idea was purely a mathematical convenience and that it didn't have any real bearing on the physical behavior of light. It was just a way to make the math work. But let's assume that those photons are real. Then they're going to be able to explain this phenomenon. One of the features of photons in Max Planck's mathematics is that they have energy that depends on their frequency and therefore on their wavelength. So as frequency goes up, the energy of a photon goes up, and that also corresponds to a decrease in wavelength. So let's illustrate what's going on here with a cartoon. On the right-hand side of your slide, you'll see a cartoon of what happens when an electron meets an infrared photon. So in our illustration, our infrared photons are sort of like kindergartners. They don't have very much strength, and so any kindergartner comes along and it kicks this ball and it tries to get this ball over the hill, but it simply doesn't have enough strength. So the kindergartner cannot get the ball over the hill, and therefore no matter how many kindergartners you line up, or how bright you make our light in our analogy, you're never going to get any balls emerging on the other side of the hill. And as these kids slowly age, they'll get stronger and stronger, until eventually we cross a threshold age where now the kid has just the minimum strength necessary to get the ball over the hill. So maybe they have to be 11, just to make up a number. So we have our 11-year-old who has just enough strength to get the ball to the top of the hill, where the ball briefly pauses because it's got no energy left after rolling up this hill, and then it decides, yeah, okay, I'm going to make my way over, and it rolls down onto the far side of the hill where we collect it in our experiment. This is what happens at the threshold wavelength in our metal, that the photons have just enough energy to free the electron from the metal, but they don't have any extra energy to give it. So the electrons come out very, very slowly at that threshold wavelength. But now we've passed the threshold, so if I bring in a whole class of 11-year-olds instead of just the one, I will get many balls on the other side of the hill instead of just my one playground ball associated with my one kid. And then finally, if we bring in not a kid, but a professional athlete, 
this athlete is going to have lots of extra energy to give to this ball, and so she's going to be able to kick it clear up and over the hill and out into orbit. And that's what happens if you go to very, very short wavelengths like X-rays or the far ultraviolet, where these photons have lots of energy, much more energy than is necessary to free the electron from the metal, and that extra energy gets translated into the speed of the electron, just like we have some extra speed of the ball on the bottom right-hand illustration. This idea is what eventually got Einstein his Nobel Prize in 1921. The Nobel Committee awarded him his prize for this idea, because this idea had already launched the quantum revolution and completely revamped our understanding of the nature of matter on the smallest scales. Relativity was still considered somewhat newfangled in 1921, and it had had tremendous success, but it was not yet as well established as quantum mechanics, which had grown out of Einstein's solution to the photoelectric effect. So these photons that Einstein invoked following Max Planck are basically just little packets of light. They're particles of light, and we still use that name to describe light when it has particle-like behavior today. Anytime we have a light shining, the, light, the energy carried by that beam of light must be an integer multiple of the energy of the photons that make up that light beam. So if you have a laser which is all red photons at some particular wavelength, then the energy carried by that laser has to be an integer multiple of the photons. And this realization that light acts like a wave when we do experiments that look for waves, but it acts like a particle when we do other kinds of experiments, like how light interacts with atoms and electrons on the smallest scales, that is what we call the wave-particle duality. And this is one of the hardest concepts in all of physics because it requires us to hold in our head two seemingly mutually incompatible ideas, that light is both a wave, which is non-local, and a particle, which is local. And physicists argue back and forth constantly and still to this day about how it's appropriate to interpret quantum mechanics and how we can understand this wave-particle duality. I have my own ideas about that, but I'm not going to go into them because this is not that rant. So when light acts like a particle, we call that particle a photon, and the energy of that particle is set by its frequency. So the energy equals a constant, symbolized by the letter h. h is what's called Planck's constant, and it's just a constant of proportionality between the frequency, f, of the photon and the energy, e, that it carries. So let's say we're working in our lab. We have lasers and the lasers are giving off photons with different wavelengths and therefore different frequencies and colors. We've got one laser, which is working right at the edge of the ultraviolet at around 350 nanometers, and then another, which is working in the red at around 700 nanometers. Which one of those photons has a greater energy? I'll pause for a minute and let you think about it. Do you know what the answer is? The photon with the shorter wavelength has the greater energy, and the photon with the longer wavelength has the lesser energy, and that's because short wavelength means high frequency, which means high energy. Okay. So how much greater is the energy of the short wavelength photon compared to the long wavelength photon? To answer that question, we're going to need to use the method of ratios. So we're going to build a ratio and then do some substitution to try and find this ratio that we're interested in. What we want to try to find is the ratio of the second photon at 700 nanometers to the energy of the first photon at 350 nanometers. So I say, okay, that's E2 divided by E1. And we know that energy is frequency times Planck's constant, so that's H times F2 divided by H times F1. Now we do a little more substitution. We know how to express frequency in terms of wavelength. Frequency is speed divided by wavelength. 
So speed divided by wavelength, I plug both of those in, so I get uh, the top of my equation is h times c, which is the speed of light, divided by wavelength 2. Whole thing divided by h times c, again, divided by wavelength 1. So those h's and those c's are going to cancel, and then you can rearrange the resulting fraction and end up with e2 divided by e1 equals lambda two, 1 divided by lambda 2. That's wavelength 1 divided by wavelength 2. So the ratio of energies is the inverse of the ratio of wavelengths. In this case, when I plug in the numbers, I find that the second uh, laser is less energetic than the first, and it's less energetic by exactly 350 over 700, which is equal to one half. Thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you again soon for another topic in astronomy.